Okay, well, we're ready to take this thing out for a little test. Uh, before I do that, though, there's actually a lot of stuff I've changed over the past few weeks on it, so we'll go through that and then uh, meet back here to watch this thing move. Got the pump back apart here. So I just want to show really, really quickly what's happening. So originally this O-ring was on here, which is not correct, I don't believe. I'm 99% sure it's supposed to go in this section here. I mean, it fits and it makes a lot of sense because when you actually slide this in, it's compressing this way. Since this was originally on here like that, all of these shims got bent inward from that O-ring. And I was thinking that like this surface was the ceiling surface, but now that I see it, it, it makes a lot more sense that the ceiling surface is actually on the inner flange against this O-ring. And when you put it in it, that's what, that's what seals it. So it doesn't matter if the shims have cracks in them or whatever. I, don't, I shouldn't need any sealant here as long as this is seated properly. Make sure it stays seated all the way in. Ow. There we go. Okay, hopefully we never have to do that again. Okay, hydraulic tank is back on, full of fluid, has not leaked yet, so that's a good sign. I've, I fixed two things off camera, I just wanna show real quick. The first is I finally resolved this fan blade. So you can see here that the, the original locks are back in here. It's actually the right tension. And this is thank you to a subscriber that noticed this and sent me the right part number. I was using the wrong parts book for this thing. This engine is way newer than the tractor and it actually uses a different parts book. This is like a 35,000 series or serial number engine. I don't have the parts book, but it is on the anti Caterpillar website. So I looked it up and sure enough, I was using the wrong belt part number. So got the right belt in here, tension perfectly, everything's set up. I shouldn't have to worry about this again. I'll probably have to tighten it after my first run coming up, but that's fine. Spiderweb. Uh -oh. Little dusty in here. <laughs> they used a uh, zip tie in place of a cotter pin. Very smart. Uh, it's probably been a while since this has been opened. Ooh, there is oil in there. Yeah. Chunkage in here. I mean, that looks clean. I see a lot of dead bugs in here. Does this come out? I uh, just found this little area. This doesn't look good. Full of junk. So what was this rubbing against? That's the spot where it was rubbing against right there. Fortunately, hopefully at least, the line, <laughs> the hydraulic line isn't like gonna bust through. I mean, we're only at a thousand PSI. I think that'll be fine. These are pretty thick lines. Easiest way to fix this is just gonna be put like a spacer on here. Shouldn't be a problem. Now that I'm actually getting into this though, I feel kind of dumb. I should have done this before, but I think that intake heater, we might move that into here because we're gonna have to do some modifications and it's, this is a way better space for it. Okay, so apparently these are all fixed. Everything's kind of spot welded or soldered together. So this is as far as you can break this thing down. I'm gonna have to clean out these screens as best as I can. And then this is cracked, but it's really not that bad. It's probably okay. I'll see if I can find a new one, but otherwise maybe I can just use like a mason jar or something. Okay, I've been thinking about what to do on this thing for a while. So I have all these screens like right behind where I need to be patching. 
I was thinking about trying to solder it, but uh, just getting a plate on here perfectly conformed to it with nothing to clamp to is gonna be hard. I don't wanna be heating this thing up a ton because of all these, these screens in here. I don't, definitely don't wanna be welding on it. So I just made up a little patch panel and then I'm just gonna use metal epoxy and, and epoxy the whole thing over and then smooth it down the safest without having to, you know, starting a fire inside this thing. Actually, it's so cold in here, I didn't even need the patch panel. It, it's just it's nice and thick. Threw a second coat on there just so I can smooth out any imperfections. I know this stuff has a bad stigma with it because hillbillies use it to like repair engine blocks and all that kind of stuff, but this is actually, in my opinion, a pretty good application for it. I think we only need about three-eighths of an inch of a spacer here. So, this is about the right size. I'm almost out of oxygen on my tank setup, so I have to kind of run it a little bit low. That's why it took so long. All right, should probably make sure the spacer is gonna work. This thing is quite heavy, surprisingly. Whoa. Okay, so there's probably like if you can make that out a quarter inch space in there. And this is a 3 8 inch spacer. So definitely the spacer was needed. That's uh, probably a good amount. As far as why it's needed, uh, if you guys have any ideas, let me know. The only thing I can think of is whoever drilled the holes for this block did them too far back and it's just hitting over there. But I mean, even if the dash was bent, this is all one solid piece. I'm kicking myself that I didn't look at this thing before, but this is the perfect spot for the intake heater. I should never have even messed with this thing because right here is perfect. And these are off of like, I think a Chevy diesel and uh, they're just the perfect size. I could probably put one here. I actually got two here and here. I know the question's gonna come up about, are these blocking the intake passage? And this here is a stock intake. So on here, you see this pipe in here? This is the uh, original intake heater, which is the exhaust pipe for the Pony. It runs right through the intake. And this creates, probably does create some blockage, but I have removed this off of my intake manifold. So I think just the combination of that, it's, it's gonna be a wash. It's not gonna be a big deal. I got my pilot holes drilled on both sides here. And I think these are thick enough. I don't, I, I, I don't think I'm gonna need to weld in bung. But since this is a late model domestic, it is metric. So this is a M22 by 1.5, which I need a 20.5 millimeter drill. And then I need the tap, which is a little bit expensive, but I think this is gonna be worth it. This is gonna be nice. By the way, these kind of heaters aren't to be confused with this type. They look pretty similar. But on this one, you actually run diesel into it. And then when you put 12 volts on it, a valve opens up and then the diesel comes out and it ignites it and then the, that flame is what heats the intake up. So these, these work really well but the issue is you have to add an extra pump for it and all the wiring. So a little more complicated than just running a nice 12 volt.
All right, this one's going in straight. So there's like four or five threads, full threads in here. Pretty decent engagement on this thing. If these ever do get loose though, I'll do a weld and bung. But I think for now, this is gonna be perfect. So we got 0.6 ohms, 0 0.4, 0 0.7. All right, so none of, nothing's grounded out. This should actually all be good to go. Next step is to do some kind of battery holding system here. Originally when I got this machine, I don't know if I have any pictures of this or video, but I'll throw them up if I have it. What they had done is they just threw a sheet of plywood down and had countersunk the bottom to fit over these bolt heads. And the battery just sat on top and presumably was just kind of flopping around in there. I'd like to do something a little bit nicer than that maybe. I did buy this box, which is for a 4D, 8D battery size. Unfortunately, I didn't really measure it beforehand and it just is not gonna fit in here. It's gonna hit those gauges back there. It'll hit this up here. It's not touching the engine block. It's not touching the dash. And it's not touching over there. I think the best mount spots are gonna be here and here. I don't wanna tap onto here because this is there's a coolant channel in there and I don't wanna cause a leak somehow. So I got these, these are just isolators. Um, you know, the battery weighs about 100 pounds, and this might be a surprise, but they're not very cheap. And I don't think it's very good for batteries to be bouncing around. This thing probably vibrates like crazy. So I'm gonna have it mounted down through rubber. It might help, maybe not, but. Another issue here is vertical height. Eight and three quarters. Yeah, it's gonna be tight. Got some eighth inch plate here. It's already cut down 10 inches wide, so this will be easy. Got a pretty nice good groove here to follow so I can just freehand it. Uh-oh. So in addition to these two mount points, I'm gonna add three other mount points, and I'm just gonna use these uh, feet, these rubber feet. These, this is the same height and hardness of rubber as the other hard mounts. So for these, I have an eighth inch spacer. The plate that these are mounted to is eighth inch. So these mounts sit an eighth inch higher. That's why I have spacers on the other side. So it's not quite rubbing there, but it might vibrate into that. So maybe I'll smooth that out, but. Well, it's not touching anywhere. That's a good sign. So I actually specifically picked these nuts because they're very shallow. So I'm gonna be putting 3 8 plate down and you can see that the nuts are not, they're underneath it. Yeah, those are some ugly welds. 
So bear with me on the welding guys. This is a new welding setup for me. I'm not used to it yet. And also I'm not a good welder, so. <laughs> super great um, I think I need more current I was using some settings that came on the welder and it looks like to me I got too much wire not enough current or maybe just not enough current I'm not sure I'll have to keep playing around with it it's good enough for this thing though it'll it'll hold together it'll hold together I'm sure looks like everything's still flush so the only grinding I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grind these down on the side because these might end up contacting uh, the actual machine I ground this one down pretty far. It's a decent amount of penetration in there. This one has a little void there, a little tiny void there. So if this was something, you know, a little bit more important, I would have spent more time practicing, but this is the welder I'm using, by the way. <coughs> the parts to fix my other one were more expensive than just, this is just like the cheap Amazon one. Okay, this is Matt from the future, a few hours in the future here, and I went online and I looked at the causes for bad welds. So this is what's known as convex welding. And the, the cause of this is usually low voltage. So I played around with some of the settings on this welder for a while and I determined that the manual was telling me something completely wrong about how to tune the voltage in properly. So once I figured that out, it was on the lowest setting. Once I figured it out, I did a medium run and a high run. And the medium run is still a little bit convex. The high one looks a lot better. It's, it's a little bit sloppy. That's just my technique. That's not the welder though. But on the highest one, it's actually almost burned through this eighth inch plate. So, you know, in practice, I should have done something between these two settings and it would have been fine. This was a good project to learn on though because it's not really structural, not important. And now I kind of know how to tune it in a little bit better. All right, final installation. I did spray this with a rubberizing, like an undercoating. Is this gonna fit? Uh oh. I did screw up on this stud. I welded this bar too close to it, so I had to cut one down slightly. There's always gotta be one screw up, right? All right, a little flush. I got a couple sheets of this battery mat stuff. There's some more I can step. Oh my gosh, this thing's heavy. There we go. There we go. There we go. Oh my gosh. It's a tight fit. This thing ain't light. It's not hitting anything. It's held in place firmly. I don't know what else you would want. I think we're good here. Okay, I made this bracket to raise this up. Use the same plate that I used on the battery box. I'm sure someone's gonna ask why I use solid plate on the battery box instead of something like square tube. It's because I had it around the shop. Fortunately, the camera wasn't rolling when I put this back in, but this is the... I don't know what you'd call this, the emergency brake. Pull, and that's locks in. And then, okay, I got everything cleaned up and painted. One thing I missed when I was taking it apart is these screens, there's six of them, you can actually take out of here and clean out. These are like the, the lowest screens or all the, you know, most of the dirt would be. Pretty lubies here. Oh my gosh. There we go. 
All right, so for the intake heaters, uh, I'm gonna use, try to use Permatex 3 to seal these threads. This works up to 650 degrees. I don't think these threads get super hot. There's not a ton of thread. I'll check these for leaks later uh, once the engine's running. It's an easy thing to do. By the way, this is the intake pipe. I have welded up the holes that I drilled in the last video. He's in here without scratching everything. I did have to cut out a small section to fit this filter. All right, now for the fun part. Ugh. Hopefully it works out. This thing is quite heavy. One thing I noticed on the old engine was that all the throttle linkage used quarter inch pins, but on this newer one, everything is three eighths. So this is off, this is off the old engine. So I need to convert it over so it doesn't jangle. So I got like a roll pin here. Okay, a couple problems on here. The first is that this doesn't quite line up. And this is like, this rod, like I said, was off the old engine. And it's kind of custom bent. It's been welded about 400 times. So it just doesn't quite fit without hitting. It just, yeah, see, it's just not centered in that hole right there. That's fine, I can bend that rod. Um, I think that's gonna be the easiest thing to do. Second issue is when you turn it all the way off, you get past this detent here, right there. When it goes all the way back, there's not enough space here. And that's probably because this rod is bent. Not perfect, but we give it a shot. At least I can probably adjust it now. We got some new pins coming. I think I got it here. So we're at, it's off right there. It, and then, not touching anywhere when I go up. This, this is like, this makes the whole thing unusable. I can't, I can't deal with this, this is terrible. I looked through the parts diagram and apparently this hole, which goes through this entire thing and through the shaft is not original. And just looking at it, I can kind of tell. But they did use the perfect size drill bit for a, what is this, 824 tap, 832 tap. So I think the way forward is just gonna be to tap these holes and then slide this down a little bit further on the shaft and then just use set screws to hold it in place.
Okay, now that the intake's on, I do see an issue. I think originally the ears on this intake pipe mounted to the pony motor. And what they've done is they took this angle iron and they drilled some holes in it. But you can see the holes on the angle iron don't even come close to lining up. So I looked through some old pictures. This is what they had as a spacer. So they ran it like that, and this is a 3 8 bolt, which I think was the original size. They had a quarter inch bolt, and then they had this running at an angle to kind of pick up the slop. It's really not a good system. This might be a surprise, but this air cleaner weighs a ton. It's sitting right there, and the only bolt spots are right there. So if this thing's jiggling around, that's a lot of torque right there. It's going to break, end up breaking these ears off. And that's probably why it was rubbing on these pipes. So I think the way to fix this, the easiest way, which is what I'm going to do, is I'm going to put a spacer on this L bracket so it comes out and it lines up properly. And then I'm really glad I got a hood because the hood is going to tie this dash to the radiator and it'll make it a lot more rigid. Okay, we got some 3 16 plate here. I'm gonna need two sheets of these to make the spacing right. Well, it's definitely got better penetration. I made a mistake here, made a mistake everywhere, but uh, it's definitely gonna be strong. I'm gonna have to grind this flat, I think, because there's not enough space underneath the dash. I only ground down this side just because the side has to be flush. Everything else is just how it is. Since this is so much wider now, this bolt won't work. But, can't remove that bolt. Just barely going to come out. it's in. There is a couple pieces of paper worth of clearance over there. Now you can see that hole lines up. This one we're gonna have to re-drill or at least kind of hog out a little bit. Okay I got some new stronger guides. Just need to cut these down. So those are lined up good. We got the three eighths in there instead of the one quarter. By the way, the ears on here are not straight. You can see this one is set out a little bit. This one's in. You know, I probably should have checked that this generator actually worked before I uh, bought a new voltage regulator here.
So I got a nice big ground lug connector there. That's four gauge. And I verified that this ground is also connected to that. So I've never actually hooked up a new regulator before, but the directions say temporary connection here to the battery. It says short this to this. There should be a spark and that is supposed to polarize the regulator. Okay, we got a spark. I heard a click in here. Okay, so I had to cut down the battery cables, I did not crimp these. And the reason I did not is because I don't think these are really suitable for crimping. Uh, the way they're flared out and there's not a lot of surface area here. I did actually have some on order for crimping and you can see the difference here. These are way longer and I was able to do two crimps, which I think is a lot better for battery stuff, especially these big ones. So you can see the comparison there. I actually got this crimper to do the stainless railing on my deck. Well over a thousand crimps on it and it's going strong. Did wear out a couple die. You go up and do 90. So apparently the switch is always gonna run the heater when the starter's running. I was not aware that's how it was gonna work, but. Okay, got the wiring done. Didn't film a lot of it because it's all kind of the same. We'll just do a quick tour here. So on the main line to the battery, I, I put another thing of conduit over it just to be safe. I ran the starter lead up through there and I actually have a fuse here for that. So everything else is fused except for this line, obviously. The switch has two positions. There's that way, that's the heater. And then there's that way, which is the starter. This is a cat switch, but there's two versions. There's a three port and a four port. And I thought the three port would just be, you know, heater or starter, but apparently it also turns on the heater when you start it, which is probably okay. But so this yellow line is the lead for the heater. And then this is also the power for the heaters. These are the heater relays. There's one relay for each heater. There's the one here and then one over there. This is a Cummins heater relay. This is how it's set up there. And I think these gauges of wires are actually bigger than they are on the Cummins or the Chevy. It's way, they're way smaller than what the current load is, but since it's only running for a few seconds, it doesn't really matter. So when those relays close, then these lights turn on, there's a light for each heater. And the point of those is to tell me that if the relays have failed in the close position, I need to deal with that as soon as possible because it will burn this wiring up. So if that happens, there's a fuse right here I can just come over, pop the fuse out, and then that'll turn the heater off. The only other wiring is the charging circuit. So this is the generator and the voltage regulator, and that runs 12 volts back to, straight to the battery, which is also fused right here. I made a giant mistake on this generator because when I had it off, and I remember now there was like liquid that poured, I think it was water probably that poured out of it. This thing, most likely bad, I never tested it. It's very easy to test a generator. All you have to do is short these two terminals put 12 volts on it and then ground it and it should spin. But uh, I did forgot, completely forgot to do that. I'm sure it won't come back to bite me. So anyway, to start this thing, all you gotta do is uh, turn the heater on. I gotta hold it. And those lights are on right there. Heaters are hopefully heating up. I can hear, like, I hear popping. That's probably a good sound, right? And then, then you would actually turn it over. <laughs> I think the one additional mod I'm gonna eventually make is to have some kind of linkage where I can reach that compression release in here easily because it's actually quite hard to uh, reach 
especially when the hood's on here, it's gonna be hard to like turn this and then reach over and flip that over. To attach stuff to the firewall, I just use these little plastic clips and then I just have stainless fasteners holding them in. So this thing should be fairly solid. Let's get it ready for a initial shakedown cruise. Almost forgot about this. I have a feeling there's supposed to be a gasket in here somewhere. It is quite cold. Well, cold for here, 28 degrees Fahrenheit, 27. Out in the sun, it's, it's a little bit better. The block is 38. So the goal here is to let this thing warm up. Uh, hopefully I like to see the coolant system work. That'd be nice. While it's doing that, I need to fill the hydraulics up. So this is already full, but all the pipes and the cylinders are all empty and there's probably three or four gallons at least. So I'm gonna have to move them a little bit and then fill that up. Hopefully it starts. Never started it this cold before. as hot as it's gonna get without riding it, so I think it's time to take it out. Uh, there was a lot of air in that hydraulic system.
the left steering clutch is not working very well. I need to adjust that. It's like, that really does nothing until you hit the brake. But this side, it uh, definitely is working there. So this, this clutch is messed up. Fix that. Yeah, I don't even have the brake on right now and I'm spinning. Back into try third. Watch out, dog. Hopefully, that's just an adjustment issue. Still not getting hot. Yeah, dog. Yeah, dog. Take a quick look at it. Just gonna do a quick health check before I go any further. I've probably ridden it for maybe 20, 25 minutes so far. I'm not sure how much of that footage is gonna be useful, but uh, let's see, it didn't really get too hot. The radiator's warm. It's just not getting super hot. That's okay, it's a pretty cold day today. Engine oil, still a good amount. No weird smells. Ooh, fan's loose. That is, that is a brand new fan, so. Had a little bit of a leak there. Uh-oh. Looks like we might have a leaking head gasket. That doesn't look good. Almost expecting that. Yeah. That's gonna have to get changed eventually. No other leaks. I think this is hydraulic fluid from when it, yeah, when it burped up. Yeah, it's still dripping. Let's see if this hasn't turned into milkshake. Yep, still has fluid. This is gonna be a short ride, but that left steering clutch, I need to get that back into adjustment. It's, clutch just seems to be fine. Can't think of any other issues. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull it back in the shop. Before I do that though, I'm gonna finally get this plastic out, kind of clean the ground up a little bit. So when I pull it back in, I can track to see any new leaks. I know that final has a small leak, but nothing else. There's, don't really think anything else is leaked. That's a spill. Okay, well hopefully this starts again.
So on that ride back, I figured out that I'm a complete idiot. Um, when I was talking about the steering clutch, what I had done for part of that ride is I had put the, the uh, emergency brake on, and that's only on the right brake. So I was wondering why the right steering clutch was working so much better, is because it was dragging on the brakes. Anyways, on the ride back, they both behave the same, but you both, on both of them, you really have to pull it back far. It's kind of annoying. Maybe there's a way to adjust that. I mean, they're new steering clutches, so maybe uh, they need some adjustment anyways. Besides that, it, it actually rides really well. Just a lot of getting used to the controls. I mean, this is my first time ever riding one of these, so bear with me. Like I said, I'm gonna let it sit for a day and start looking over any leaks. I wanna get all those fixed before I put the skid plate on and the blade on, and obviously, because then it's way harder to work around those. Also, clearly gonna have to order a new head gasket. Is that, it's not a ton of work to get it off, is it? Let's see, uh, the water pump, exhaust manifold, intake manifold. Oh man, okay, I take that back. I did verify that the winch spins forward and backwards. Um, I think I put a video on like Instagram, or maybe it was a YouTube short or something showing that, but yeah, that works fine. The controls all work for that. I am kind of thinking I should get the blade on and the, the skid plate on now, but then I'm also worried to get the head gasket off, it'd probably be nice to come in here with the cherry picker, and I can't do that if, I can probably get the skid plate on, but not the blade. So, or I might just wait maybe a few months and do the head gasket later. I don't know, let me know what you guys think. All right guys, it's been a few days, but I have updates on this head gasket situation. I did a little bit of research. It turns out that in some of these old cat engines, it's kind of a common problem where they start weeping, cooling out the sides like this. And there's actually a fairly, I don't know what the chances are, maybe 50% chance that if I just back all the head fasteners off and then retorque everything, it might resolve the problem. The fact that it's kind of leaking out equally on both sides, maybe that's a good sign that it'll uh, seat back down. So that's the first thing to try. And then we'll go from there. As far as leaks, this was when I when all the air burped out of the hydraulic system, it got all over the radiator and so it's just leaking. That's hydraulic fluid from that. It's leaking from the radiator, not from the pump. And then we have a couple, those look like oil drips there and over there. That final is no longer leaking, which is interesting. There's one little drip there and then there's a leak coming. I think it's coming from the winch. I'm not sure where, but uh, we'll have to fix all that stuff. Anyway, at least we have a plan going forward. So it's gonna be retorque it, take it out, drive it again. And uh, that'll be good because I need to check the valve lash anyway, so I have to pull the cover off to retorque it. And then we'll go from there, either replace the head or be working on the blade next.